my winners. This is Erwin bringing you the Truth About Real Estate Investing show. And I hope you're having a great week and enjoying the summer. Uh, you may have noticed we didn't release an episode last week as I was tied up with Cherry's birthday week. And it was her idea that we would golf three times, including taking one lesson. Do you know the saying, you can't have your cake and eat it too? As in you cannot have two incompatible things. Or you can't have the best of both worlds. Well, I've been, I've never been, never been much, uh, been one to conform to rules. So other than Cherry being my wife and mom to our kids, we also invest in real estate together. We stock hack together. We own several businesses together. We golf together. When I'm more disciplined, I actually go to the gym with Cherry together. <laughs> Cherry, Cherry is better at golf than I am. She beat me uh, two of the three outings we had last week. She also beat me last week at stock hacking. So uh, I think the score is now uh, for she trader versus he trader. She is beating the he trader uh, by the score of about 15 to 6. I do have other family members who stock hack as well. My little cousin, his name is Chubby. He had big, big, big cheeks as a baby. So my brother called him Chubby and the nickname stuck. It's been 35 years. <laughs> Anyways, Chubby is a musician by trade, a beginner real estate investor. And he was a buy and hold investor of stable stocks like uh, Canadian banks. During Thanksgiving last year, we had my extended family over to my house for dinner. And remember those days when you can have like 20 people in your home? Anyways, I told Chubby he was leaving money on the table, investing in stocks the way he was. So I showed him how I would stock hack. I gave him Derek Foster's book, Money for Nothing, and your stocks for free. Fast forward to 10 months later, he sends me a screen capture of his trading app showing me his returns are 22% for this year so far. Because of the way we trade, that's all cash returns. And 22% so far for the year in 2020. I'm recording this on August 11th. Other than the crazy returns, I'm super proud of him. He can't convince his wife to learn stock hacking. And then, like I said, you know what's crazy is my cousin's cash flow is greater than the average Canadian's work income. And again, this is all for 2020. He was trading during the COVID crash of February and March as well. So fantastic results. Uh, note, Chubby does want to be a real estate investor, as in he is a real estate investor, but he'd like to do more. It's just not easy as a millennial, as anyone can appreciate, to raise a, that 20% down payment. But you can agree, there is, most of you listeners, if you're listening to this show, then I'm pretty sure you agree that there is no better asset class to build wealth in than real estate, in my experience. If you're interested in learning more about stock hacking, I'll be giving a free demo on Tuesday, August 18th in the evening via Zoom. It's either 7 or 8 o'clock. Eastern time. It will be a bit more detailed. Actually, it'll be a lot more detailed than the demo I did for Chubby over, over turkey and wine. But my hope is it's the same for you, the listener, to create a steady stream of cash flow for yourself. The bigger, the better. Those who get my emails will see an invite. And if you're not already on my email list, well, that's just silly. So if you're interested, go to www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca and simply input your name and email. And I hope to see you Tuesday, August 18th in the evening via Zoom. On to this week's guest. Monica Lee, who is like family, uh, Chubby is blood family. Uh, Monica is like family as she is Cherry's BFF and godmother to our most prized assets. <laughs> I call them assets, our son and daughter. Uh, Monica and husband Rich, they are rich, but Rich's name is actually Rich, you know, short for Richard. They are both second generation Canadians. Their parents immigrated to Canada from Korea with not much in search for a brighter future for their kids. And they found it. Canada is the greatest country for opportunity, statistically, even though America says they are. Uh, actually, Canada is statistically. Anyways, Rich and Monica both became lawyers who eventually quit their law <laughs> jobs, along with those six-figure salaries to become full-time real estate investors. Monica invests, Monica with, together with Rich, but for simplicity, I just say Monica invests in cottages for short-term rentals. She has a couple of them. She just sold a couple as well. They have a couple commercial retail properties, plazas. They buy them really beaten up and mostly vacant. And then they, you know, you could call it burr. You could call it burr strategy for commercial property. They develop and build houses. And more recently, around the same time as uh, Chubby, basically, she learned to stock hack. And she's she's well into six figures already while being the mom to three great young kids. I know her kids well. They're great kids. So, yeah, wow. Capable of doing a lot, eh? Just wait to hear the story about how someone told Monica's oldest son that she would fail and give up as a stock hacker. Her response is pretty epic. I present to you, Monica Lee. So Monica, what's keeping you busy these days? Stock trading. Uh -huh. That's a daily thing. I've become a day trader all of a sudden. <laughs> but you always were, right? No, I, this started in September, mm -hmm. I think, with the first course. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up losing... A little bit of money in mm -hmm. March, mm -hmm. then got a great trainer or coach mm -hmm. and have been super, super busy. 
Because of him, I became a day trader.、Mm -hmm. You spend a lot more time doing this than I do. <laughs> yeah, because I don't have a full time job. <laughs> okay, so what do you do then? What would you say your occupation is? Someone asks you, "What do you do?" What would you say? Now I tell them I'm an investor.、Mm -hmm. So a real estate investor as well as a trader. Okay, where's mom fit into that? If you asked me before the lockdown, I'd say <laughs> I, I'm a great mom, especially because I can send kids to school and I get that break.、Uh -huh. Without the break, yeah, I'm an awful mom. <laughs> Your kids are pretty awesome, so I think you're a little bit hard on yourself. Oh no, you haven't spent twenty four seven with them. Yeah, I mean, that's difficult for everyone. But again, your kids are pretty fabulous. Okay, fine. They're pretty good considering. I still need a break. Yeah. And I'm thankful that I can escape to your office. <laughs> Let's start from the beginning, so people have an idea who you are. Like you are a、uh, you are a lawyer. Yeah,、right? I'm a lawyer by trade. Well,、okay. actually, both my husband and I are lawyers by trade.、Mm -hmm. And we both gave it up after collecting a few properties. We realized you can make actually a lot more from properties than practicing law. Right. So、uh, lawyers make okay money. Yeah. But you made you found that you made more money in real estate.、Mm、hmm. Yeah. You definitely make a lot more money、mm -hmm. through real estate.、Um, lawyers charge by the hour.、Mm -hmm. Real estate, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time.、Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it just it just made more sense for us.、Mm -hmm. And you guys bought a business too before going all in on real estate. You guys bought a business. Oh, that's right. My husband had a printing business.、Mm -hmm. He he tried it. We actually sold a house that he just built to fund the business.、Mm -hmm. He thought he'd make a go of it. It didn't do as well as he thought it would,、mm -hmm. and it certainly didn't do as well as our real estate properties.、Mm -hmm. So I kind of told him, "Well, let's pick." Mm -hmm. Either pick the business or pick properties, but we can't do both. Right, and you already said no to job. <laughs>、oh. oh my gosh! Once you leave the office, you really can't go back to the nine to five.、Right. And actually, in my case, it was more like a eight to seven,、mm -hmm. and then have dinner with the kids, have them go to bed, and then I continued working. Right. So it was long hours. Now, again, no one on this show gets their questions in advance. So I'm just thinking off the top of my head. You guys probably made quite a bit of money as lawyers. Yeah.、Uh, probably yeah. over four hundred thousand combined. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay.、So、yeah. That's what you turned down to do to start your own business and to do. And I always consider real estate as a small business. It's not. Yeah.、Right? Yeah. Once you have a small portfolio, yeah, it becomes a business.、Mm -hmm. And then, how did you guys start? What kind of investments did you do? We first had a couple of houses in Etobicoke.、Mm -hmm. And then we ventured out. I feel like we followed you and Cherry out、mm -hmm. to St. Catharines.、Mm -hmm. You were already doing houses and almost flips in Tobacco, were you not? Yeah, at the same we, time. We had a couple. Sorry, this is going back ten years, I think. Yeah, we don't even for a while. Cherry's known you for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ten years at least. No, th so the way we started, we were looking for houses for us to live in,、mm -hmm. and my husband decided. He wanted to build a house,、mm -hmm. but builders were so expensive, <laughs> and so while he was working full time, he's like, "Screw this! Sorry, forget it." Oh, we've had worse language.、Okay. Don't worry. I can do this. So he became the the builder, and he watched a lot of YouTube,、mm. and we had a friend who just recently went through this, so he was able to ask her a lot of questions,、mm -hmm. and so it took him twice as long. And probably a little bit more money to build our first house,、mm -hmm. but we walked away with five hundred grand from that first build. How long did that take you? It took him a year to build.、Um, it took us six months to decide on the house plans because I thought it was going to be our forever home, and so probably almost two years.、Mm -hmm. Almost two years to from purchase to actually moving in.、Mm -hmm. And that's also your education as well. So I think people need to appreciate that the first one's never going to go well. No, no. It's an investment in your education if you, if that's part of your plan to go forward. But it,、yeah. this was your just your plan for a home for yourselves. Yeah, it was. It was my husband just deciding he didn't want to spend the money,、right. and and then he became the builder, and、right. that's kind of what started him on his journey. Right. So since that first property, we have since purchased three buildings. Mm -hmm. Which he then renovated is extensively one building, one large building, and built a couple other houses. Right. 
Sorry, what was the large building? Uh, the one in Muskoka. I think you did a podcast on it. It's in Muskoka, Brace Bridge. Video. We shot a video. Oh, you shot a video. Okay. Yeah. It's a 20,000 square foot uh, multi-use building in Brace Bridge, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is one of the three towns in Muskoka. Okay. Wait, before we get to that, I haven't had enough guests talk to what your other strategy was, uh, but with your, your buying houses. Because I think it's, um, it's an opportunity I don't think everyone's looking at yet, but it's coming because I think most of our listenership... Uh, just like you know how we invest, we um, we buy in areas, you know, at least an hour out of Toronto. And I think most people do that as well because they're looking for cash flow. But, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you were buying houses like 50-foot lots, tearing them down. You probably severed it first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah, you, you can sever a lot even with the house still on it. So in Toronto, you can sever a lot with the house on it. Yeah. In Mississauga, I learned the hard way that they require you to knock down the house first in order to get the severance. What if you don't get the severance? So that's that's the problem, right? And initially when we bought the house, we bought it with a mortgage on it. Mm. But with no house, you kind of have to tell the bank, sorry, there's no more house. I need to pay this out. Oh um, so Toronto is way easier right. in terms of severing right. than Mississauga. But it didn't even dawn on me to think of asking that question when we bought the house in Mississauga. Okay, so listeners, if you have a mortgage on the property, make sure you let the bank know that you're going to tear it down. <laughs> then you're going to lose your mortgage. Like they want, mortgage. A, they want a house. Right, right. But in Toronto, you can get the severance first before you yeah. go down these plans. Yeah, and actually, you can actually then sell the house with the severance approved. Mm-hmm. And so then you can sell it for a lot more. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the uplift is in price if you have the severance in place? Probably a couple hundred thousand dollars more. A couple hundred thousand dollars just to purchase a piece of paper, essentially. Yeah. That's a good business. But that also (laughs) means you went through the hassle of getting the severance and there's an actual approval. If somebody bought a 50-foot lot and then went through that, there's no guarantee you'll actually get that. Right. So there definitely is value and time, time value as well. Right. So how long would that take then? I would say about six months with COVID now delaying a lot of applications. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure Mm -hmm. what's going to happen. That's still Um, a pretty good payday. (laughs) Oh, it's an amazing payday. So we actually were, we just found a lot. By chance, we went up to Muskoka this weekend Uh and we happened to come across a listing. We went to go see the property and I fell in love with the lot. So in order to pay for that lot, now we're going to go through our existing portfolio to see which ones we can sell. Mm -hmm. And we have one house in Etobicoke, which is a 50-foot lot. Lots of houses were severed on Mm -hmm. this lot. So Mm -hmm. our lot is probably one of the last 50-foot lots Mm -hmm. on the street. So we can most certainly get a severance. So initially, we were going to build. Build and then sell the houses. I think at this point, it might be better for us to just get the severance, Mm -hmm. sell it, Mm -hmm. With the approval and then use the proceeds to build on the Muskoka lot. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's finish. Let's still finish the strategy. <laughs> How much more would you make if you got the severance and then you built them yourself? So then the plan would be to build semi-detached homes. No, no, they're detached homes. So if you oh, went to Toronto, okay. um, you'd see all these skinny twin skinny. houses. Yeah. Like they, Three there's stories, literally, I ones. think, two feet between the houses. You can't have windows or anything. So... There really is no benefit to having this as detached, except to say it's a detached home. And people will pay more for that? Because it costs you more. Well, they'll pay way more because in the future, if you have semis, then who's going to take care of the roof? Like, it looks funny if you have half the roof done, right? I'm surprised people care that much because they could probably save a bit of money on owning a semi versus a detached house when there's only... Two feet between the houses. Yeah, I would still 100% go for a detached. <laughs> okay. Um, that's news to me. Okay, cool. But yeah, there there really is no difference in footprint right, in right. the house. You're pouring the foundation at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure how they finish the brickwork on the inside with only two feet in between, Ew. but they somehow get it done. I don't know. I'm not going to do it, so I don't care. How much more money do you think you'd make if you built the two detached homes? So detached homes in Etobicoke, these twin houses, they mm-hmm. go for about 1.7. Okay. Two years ago, it would have been 1.4. Mm-hmm. So in just in a couple of years, it went up 300,000. 
So it's actually that number that my husband struggles with because you can make way more if you built it. Yeah. But then you then have to get Terry on. You have to, or hire somebody with Terry on. Mm-hmm. And then you have to go through a year of building. And we've never gotten construction financing. So then that also means a lot of cash has to be saved up front to fund the build. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which then takes away from my trading account, which I won't be happy with. <laughs> so lots of lots of you know moving parts, and we just have to figure out how to fund our next project. So my listeners going to want to know what's the uh, average build cost per square foot. I know it's a difficult question, but if you could give us an idea, and how, how big is this house uh, that you sell for one point seven? Little over two thousand square feet. Okay. So it could be three regular sized bedrooms upstairs or four tiny bedrooms. Wow. So we're talking about like 850 a square foot, which is not bad compared to a condo because condos can go, new construction condos can go for over 1,200 square foot. And then you have to pay condo fees. Mm -hmm. So my mom bought a um, 1,600 square foot townhouse Mm -hmm. in Etobicoke. So I think her frontage is maybe 14 or 15 feet. They're tiny. Mm -hmm. Her townhouse goes for a million dollars. So this would be, you know, as opposed to 14 or 15, you would get 20 feet. And on a 25-foot lot, you still need to leave five feet on one side. Maybe four feet and then one foot. I don't know. It's about 20 feet to cross. It's crazy. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the commercial property. How did you guys get into that? Cash flow. Actually, no, no, no. You're looking for cash flow? No, um, mortgage. So before I quit law, Mm -hmm. I refinanced all of my properties. Mm -hmm. So I was able to get everything. I was able to get a large line of credit against my house. Mm -hmm. After quitting law, I no longer have the income to support my principal residence mortgage, Mm -hmm. never mind anything else. Mm -hmm. So it made it so much more difficult to get a mortgage, which means I wouldn't be able to buy more properties. So commercial properties... They, they don't care about your income. They just care about the income, the rent produced in this building mm-hmm. from this property. Mm-hmm. What does the rent support? And what does it support? Oh, outside of Toronto, Cherry would know better. But <laughs> one example, we have a, um, a plaza, an 8 to 10 unit plaza, just outside of Barrie. And we got it for 950000 it cash flowed about 50K every year up until two years ago when my husband and I were so focused on other buildings that we didn't get a chance to rent out a couple of units. <laughs> so you're a little busy and it's a little far from home. It is. How far is the drive? An hour. An hour. And Rich actually has an apartment locally, does he not? Well, that plaza is outside of Barrie. He has a, an apartment up in Bracebridge, which right. is where the big building is. The 20,000 foot building. It's hard to track all this. I agree. (laughs) And then how's the commercial mortgage work? Did they, the bank wants basically all the numbers on everything. Mm -hmm. But you guys have, uh, I forget which property it was. I think it was Bracebridge where it was an interesting deal. Like that property sat for quite some time before you guys came along. Uh, We have two buildings in Bracebridge. (laughs) One is a smaller 7,000 square foot building, Uh three storefronts, three offices on the second floor. Mm-hmm. I think we bought within 30 days of list mm-hmm. and we had to close within 30 days of our offer. Mm-hmm. Wow. 30 days for commercial financing. Yeah. That's quick. And and I think that's the only reason why we ended up getting it oh. because most people can't get financing mm-hmm. secured within 30 days. For a commercial mortgage, it's next to impossible. But I was lucky because I already had line of credit mm-hmm. ready. So I knew mm-hmm. if I didn't get the commercial mortgage in time, I had the line of credit right. that I can use. So I think the lesson for investors is, you know, be ready. Be ready at all times, basically. Oh my gosh, 100%. And then the big property. <laughs> that oh one's sad, God. did it not? It was in the news. Yeah. Your husband was in the news for it. Oh, really? Yeah, I saw the new, I saw the article. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I don't know. Um That was listed for many, many months. Uh And literally most people, you get there and they don't even want to set foot in the building. It was 95% vacant. 
the roof had issues, right. in which case then it started leaking. Then you had mold issues. Like mm -hmm. the building was not, was essentially a knockdown. And my husband is the only person who wanted to go back, I think, three times. And he went through the whole building. Mm -hmm. I think he told me, I think like only like seven people went through the whole thing. I'm not even sure if all, all of them went through the whole thing. The agent said very few people went through. And Rich was probably the only one that went through on three separate occasions, mm -hmm. which really meant he was interested. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think many people would be, have the appetite for that deal. No, but we got that building for $370,000. A 20,000-foot building in downtown Bracebridge for three seventy. dollars like, I feel like you would have a number of investors who have $370,000 in at least line of credit room mm -hmm. who could purchase it. Okay, hang on. What's the renovation budget? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this is 20,000 square feet, was it? Yeah. We tend to not budget things, <laughs> we kind of just go with the flow. And um, I deal with the finances, my husband deals with the reno. Mm -hmm. And so he just tells me, how much to pay. Mm -hmm. So there was no planning, mm -hmm. no discussion on a monthly basis, even on an annual basis. It was kind of like we we just kind of put out the fires mm -hmm. as needed. So we ended up spending a million dollars cash. Okay. Not everyone has a million in their line of credit, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the truth about real estate investing. So I, pr I push. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember when we went to visit the site. I remember when we were driving up to the parking lot, Rich had a jackhammer in his hands and he oh was jackhammering. God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's so hands-on. So hands-on. And literally, he could have three or four contractors that he's paying. Yeah. And they're standing there and he's doing the hard work. It drives me crazy. I can't watch. So he's, yeah, he's hands-on. Yeah. He leaves from the front. Which I think is good. Uh, I think it's a good idea for especially a visible minority in a town of not visible minorities Yeah. Uh, for an out-of-town investor who people think just, you know, I think he was driving his convertibles. Yeah. German car at the time. <laughs> so it's not the image you want to portray necessarily. <laughs> he might have had the truck, but I think that day he had the convertible. So, yeah. Yeah. I think leading from the front is important. You just can't do it all the time. He can't no. be jackhammering the whole time. Right. But yeah, he's pretty hands-on. And then what about now? You said it was like 95% vacant. 95 vacant. How's it now? So now it's 80% occupied. Mm -hmm. and um, Oh, even during COVID. Oh my gosh. He spent two years up there. We have an apartment up there. He spent two years up there. He knows all the employees at the town office. He knows the mayor. He's gotten to know a lot of people in town. This is a historical building, not designated heritage. Um, but it's a, I know, thank goodness. But it's a historical building that everybody knows about. So yeah. there's a lot of history. There's a lot of nostalgia it's on attached the main strip. to, yeah, attached to this building. So it's a popular building. And if we just wanted it filled, we can have it filled in a heartbeat. He's just being a little pickier. And certainly we're not, cash flow isn't the first thing we're looking at. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a building, some kind of a community. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a vision, I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you yeah. have a vegan restaurant in there. Yeah. You, you have a, which is funny because it's right next to the candy store. <laughs> 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 and you had a, is that restaurant, is the brewery open? Yes. The oh, brew wow. Pub, the brew pub is open. Wow. That was um, where Muskoka Breweries actually first started, was in this building. And um, I think one or two years before we took over, they left. And just before they left, the previous landlord built a um, new tank house. And so normally, if you put hundreds of thousands of dollars into improving property for the tenant, you get a long-term lease. I'm not sure why the former landlord didn't have that in place. Mm -hmm. So Muskoka Breweries up and left and left a brand new tank house. So Rich was able to find a brewer who wanted to open a brew pub. Right. So. And they're spending a small fortune. Oh, yeah. I haven't been inside yet. I have the kids 24-7, mm -hmm. so we haven't been yet. But mm -hmm. they just opened, actually just before COVID. That'd be cool. Let's go see it. Let's go see it. Yeah, because when we saw it, it was, you know, far from ready. Like, no finishes were there. Oh, yeah, yeah. It would be ready. Yeah, come up to our cottage and drop by Bracebridge. Okay, so now speaking of cottages, how many cottages do you have? Oh, okay, so I just sold 
are three cottages in Misco- in um, Osega. Yep. Okay. So that closes in November. Okay. So now I have one cottage. Just one? No, sorry, two. Okay. You l- sorry, you're losing two. track. Okay. It's yeah, okay. I'm losing track. Yeah. One in Huntsville, one in Kearney, just outside of Huntsville. Mm-hmm. You rent out one of them. The cottage by the lake outside of Huntsville, that one is rented out short term mm-hmm. on a weekly basis mm-hmm. and it's always full. Mm-hmm. So I normally have to book off a week for myself to use it. And uh, what are the nightly rates? For that now, it's four thousand a week. Mm-hmm. Four thousand a week. <laughs> and what about the uh, winter season, snowmobile season? Oh, that will then rent out for about thirty five hundred a month during winter. Yeah, January, February, and you can rent it out March as well. Right. So uh, for anyone interested in doing short-term rentals, cottages specifically, like, I don't know if you, did you know that going in? That no. there would be a snowmobile season? No. But when we actually went to go look, the agent talked about it. Got it. So we knew it was a possibility. But we bought this thinking it was our family cottage. Mm-hmm. The only reason why we, we decided to rent it out is because I started feeling obligated to go up every weekend. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to feel tied to a property yeah, that's the downside of cottages. You need the obligation to go because it's burning a hole in your pocket. Mm-hmm. But if you're able to rent it out, like three thirty five hundred a month, that's fantastic. So my, the, the lesson I wanted investors to to listen the listener to take, pay attention to is if you're going to do cottage rentals, see if you can do if you can rent it out in the winter as well. Yeah, because that's yeah. got to help. Well, it helps, and you also don't want to leave a property vacant for too long. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the money helps. Mm-hmm. It's more. I wanted somebody in there to make sure everything's okay. Mm-hmm. Does this cash flow or does it break even? Oh, it it more than cash flows. So if you think about it, there's 12 weeks in the summer. Mm-hmm. We bought the property for 335000 four years ago. I have a $200,000 mortgage on it. <laughs> so if, it, if I just take the summer rentals at $4,000 a week, that's essentially like a four thousand dollar a month mortgage. Mm-hmm. Sorry, um, rent that I get in a city home. Right. So that's so that it in work. itself more than works, right. right? And then there's the the winter that I can winter months that I can rent it out. And in the spring and the fall, you can do you can easily rent it out for weekends, awesome. weekend rentals. So it, yeah, more than carries itself. Amazing. Now we have, let's. I know you have to go to yoga. <laughs> Pilates. <laughs> Pilates. So we have to get to what's keeping you busy. You enjoy the stock hacker. Like, oh my I, God. I think the timing worked out well too for all of us yeah. because COVID made us, tied us up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it allowed us. It's funny because I've seen some stuff out there on Facebook, both both pro and negative. One saying that, you know, we should be taking this time to learn a new skill. And then the other side says, don't put any pressure on yourself. <laughs> so this is already stressful enough. <laughs> you don't have to learn a new skill. <laughs> but you, you're learning a new skill. You've yeah. been at it since September. Yeah. How's it going? Great. It was perfect timing during lockdown. I needed something. I think I would have gone crazy. I would have taken out on the kids. Like I needed to learn something new. And so having the new coach who then teaches you a million different ways of trading mm-hmm. really forced me to study it. Mm-hmm. So I think I spent six hours, at least six hours a day, just studying his methods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You think that's okay. Interesting. You took a lot more, you took more time into learning this than I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's because in order for me to feel comfortable, I need to know it inside out. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now that you know it inside out, what do you think? There's a lot more to learn. <laughs> A lot more to learn, but it's amazing. Mm -hmm. There's so many different moving pieces. And if you have a certain trade in order to salvage it, Mm -hmm. whether it's going up or down, Mm -hmm. there's so many different ways of profiting Mm -hmm. from a trade. So, yeah, it's fun. It's it's a game. It's a game? It's become a game. And you enjoy it? Yeah. And it's profitable? Especially because... It's profitable. If I was losing for months on end, then I might call it. I might just say, forget it. I'll take the loss and do something else with it. Mm -hmm. But it has been really, really profitable. What can you share about profitability? Because this is this is a a show about investing. (laughs) So my corporate account has a larger 
Capital. Mm -hmm. I started that in April once I spent about a month learning the coach's methods. I'm up 48%, 48.88 or something like that. I try to get you to do a screenshot of this for me. But yeah, year to date, it's almost 50%. So, and that's since April. So April, it is now August 11th as we record. Uh, that's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Admittedly, we all took losses during the COVID crash, uh, but it also enabled us to make more profit from the bottom to the top. Mm -hmm. Right. You are a woman. I think people... I don't know if people know. Come on, you can tell by my voice. I, these days, you can't make judgments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm female. What have your friends said? You've told a lot of your friends about this. Female friends, male friends too, I'm sure. What do they say? And this is something you know, that upset, this bothers me. It's always bothered me because personally, I've always had strong women in my life. Like my first boss was a woman. She was fantastic. My uh, my boss at IBM was a woman. My, and then my VP about her was a woman. So I'm used to strong women in my life always. About half of our clientele is women. Sometimes they're married. Yeah. But many times the case is it's the wife that's driving that business. Yeah. Right? So I'm used to women being very good at many things. And Cherry as well. Yes, and Cherry as well. She doesn't stop. But it, it bothers me that when we look at the classroom of Stock Hacker, it's, women are a minority. Yeah, for sure. And um, just even my circle of close girlfriends. Mm -hmm. I want them to make money. That way we can travel together. We can, we can enjoy life together. Mm -hmm. But I told all of them about it. I mm -hmm. mean, I told them about real estate along the way. Mm -hmm. I actually even opened up my books and said, this is how much I bought this for. This is how much rent I get. This is the mortgage I pay. Like I, I've opened everything up to them. Mm -hmm. And they all love the result. But they don't want to do the work and mm -hmm. they're a little scared of getting in. Mm -hmm. The same thing with um, stock hackers. I almost feel like because we make so much, it's almost unbelievable to them. Yeah. To the point where they're thinking there's no way they can do that. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's Monica. If she was able to do all this with real estate. Now she's able to do this with trading. Mm -hmm. But really, I truly had no idea what I was getting myself into. And actually, before I took your course, I didn't trade a single stock. I left it to the bank to trade my account. Mm -hmm. And they had a 1%, maybe 2% <laughs> return on annual return. And when I questioned them on it, like they didn't really know what to say. They still get their 1% fee mm -hmm. on my total account. Yeah. So whether I only made 1% didn't matter to them. Uh -huh. And this mutual fund guy at Investors Group, who was my husband's friend, he was arguing with me about 2.7%. He's like, oh, no, 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 Monica, it's 3.1%. And I'm like, whether it's 3.1% return or 2.7% return, either way, it sucks. Yeah. So that's what I was used to. And so to have almost 50% return in, what, four months? Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And even within the four months, I mean, it, was, it went up and down. It mm -hmm. wasn't that straight up. So I went through the ups and downs. I'm still at 50%, almost 50%. Fantastic. So yeah, I almost feel like my friends that I show this to, they don't want to take the first step. Mm -hmm. I think your listeners are different because they're already investors and they already have that personality where mm -hmm. they want to grow mm -hmm. and they're willing to take the risk mm -hmm. and put in the work. What questions do people ask you about this? For example, like Cody. I know Cody was asking you questions about what we do. Oh my God. Cody was asking a lot of questions? me. He was asking me a lot about the coach. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Like what he's teaching, like what my returns are, how much of my capital am I using? Mm -hmm. And right now I'm at 70 to 80% cash. Mm -hmm. Even with that, I'm still at, at almost 50% return. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think even to Cody, what I was making almost sounds unreal. Mm -hmm. It is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I would have never believed it. My advice to Cody though was, you know, not my advice. I said, if I was him, I would keep doing what he's doing and I'd add more money to do other trades. Because yeah. that's what I do. Yeah. I do Lee Lowell's trades. I do uh, Coach Chris's trades. 
and I do some crazy stuff as well. <laughs> <laughs> but again, everyone's requirements are different. This is a small percentage of your net worth. Yeah. Your trading account. Have you done anything with the money he spent? So one of my clients, oh. one of my longtime clients, he texted me last night. He bought a hot tub with his profits. Oh, really? That's amazing. Okay, so I do <laughs> have a story. A, okay, yeah, okay. Okay. I don't know the story. So <laughs> I've been asking my husband for a boat <laughs> for three years. Because now that my kids are getting bigger, they want to go tubing. They want to go water skiing. Mm-hmm. And we can only do this if I go to my friend's cottage. Mm-hmm. And I don't like relying on other people. When I want to go, I want to go. Mm-hmm. So I've been asking him, mainly because I don't want to deal with the maintenance. And I certainly don't want to drive the boat. So I need his buy-in. So he kept saying no. Because you would have bought the boat otherwise. Oh, without uh, your husband, otherwise. Without, of course. Without discussion. Okay. Of course. All right. So <laughs> he said no. And so beginning of, of um, COVID, again, we're talking about this, especially now that I feel like, we can't travel anywhere. Then we have we have to go to our cottage, in which case I want a boat. Kept saying no. So I told him, if I make $100,000 from trading, mm-hmm. we're not talking about anything else, it's trading, will he get a boat? And he thought about it. He said, okay. He only said okay because 100% <laughs> he did not believe I could make $100,000 from trading. <laughs> On a million-dollar account yeah. or... The bank, they're supposed to be professionals. Yeah. They were nowhere close right. to $100,000. Right. So They don't have to be, though, because people will give them their money no matter what. Right. right? They, don't, they don't have to no, be. No, but in order to get into their group, I had to actually sell a property. Right. Because you had to have a minimum million dollars to invest yeah. in order to get into this group. But you made that money with mutual funds, right? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. Real estate. Oh, honestly, real estate really saved us. Or gave us our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Anyways, so my husband, he did not believe I could make Mm $100,000. Well, come end of June, I made the Mm $100,000. I showed it to him. Mm -hmm. And now he's stuck getting a boat. So he has been looking for a boat. Actually, you were pretty close to getting one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, last week. Right. How did this do in this this deal? Well, because we didn't have a boat, (laughs) I thought, oh, we can just rent a sea do. There were no boats available to rent. So we rented a sea do just by chance, and my daughter fell in love with it. Uh-huh. She loved the speed. She loved, she loved everything about it. Uh-huh. So I then made 40000 more uh-huh. since I showed him the $100,000 earning. Yeah. And so I told him, you know what? We can buy a sea do as well. Right, right. So he's looking for both. Uh, even just go back a few months, didn't Rich not think you would even stick with this for very long? He, he told my son, he said, don't worry, mommy will do this for a couple of months, uh-huh. lose a few thousand, and then move on. Uh-huh. That was what he told my son. So he uh-huh. had no faith in me uh-huh. with trading. Uh-huh. Mainly because I was never interested in it. And, and we saw what professionals could do. We can do way better yeah. with that money mm-hmm. if we put it in real estate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... Well, I'm yeah. sure you're real, no different than your real estate probably outperforms any sort of REIT as well. Oh, they're yeah. professionals. For sure. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Right. Like you have your own commercial property. I'm pretty sure it beat any REIT. Yeah. Yeah. But, but honestly, the benefit to um, trading, it allowed me to diversify because I was really, really real estate heavy. Mm-hmm. And it actually also, also gives me liquidity. So the new cottage that I'm looking at buying, I have liquid assets to show the bank. Mm-hmm. Whereas before, I would have to take money out of my line of credit, Mm -hmm. deposit it in a bank account Mm -hmm. for 30 days, Mm -hmm. and then use that Mm -hmm. as proof of down payment. So it actually really helps even our real estate portfolio. Uh, You have a sizable uh, real estate holding. How does the cash flow match up between the two? So I'm not cash flow. I don't focus on cash flow. We were so focused on developing. Mm -hmm. So that big building, Mm -hmm. that took almost two years Mm -hmm. and in a million dollars put into it. Mm -hmm. That was never planned. Okay, so negative cash flow. (laughs) I kind of just do a dance. And I I have a feeling a lot of your um, listeners also do the same thing, or I hope they do. They just kind of move wherever there is money. Mm -hmm. It just keeps moving to wherever it's needed. And Cherry, luckily Cherry does my taxes 
she doesn't necessarily like what I'm doing, but I'm just doing what's needed. Mm -hmm. And then she figures everything else, everything out for me. So Mm -hmm. I'm thankful to Cherry and her team. Okay. You're going to let me know if you're cash flowing on the commercial property at least. Oh, so no. So now that it's 80% occupied, oh, I'm 100% cash flowing. Okay. I expect that building to bring us about almost $200,000 net, uh-huh. net income. Uh-huh. And that's probably, and the, the investment's probably double what you have in your trading account. It's a lot more effort. I always look at it this way, because I regularly, I talk to my friends that do stock hacking and real estate investing, because almost all my friends do both. All my real estate, mm, all I my friends. really all, compared the two. Because we compare it all the time. Because I think the whole reason we got into real estate was, well, I can make more money here than, than all these other places. Mm. Right? So then still, the, the same thing happens. Like, I have this opportunity here. Like, you know, I can fund my account, 100 grand, whatever. Same thing I would buy, use to buy a house, which, yeah. which provides me the better return. Right? Now, I always say real estate, I don't think there's any better wealth creation category than, than real estate. But the cash flow... Like just think how much how much our everyday stock hacker makes on a hundred grand in cash flow, and that should beat the piece of real estate, especially when most of us got into real estate for cash flow. Yeah, yeah. Right. So for me, I think trading provides me more cash flow. Right, right. But it could still do both. It I'll could be an illusion, though, both. in a lot of ways, because real estate. It goes up in value actually yeah, yeah, quite a bit. So yeah. we're talking hundreds of thousands oh, of know. dollars that it goes up. Oh, I know. Trading, you know, it's 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 mm-hmm. at a time. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's hard to compare. I wanted to diversify yeah, yeah. and this allows me to diversify. Right. I wanted more cash flow. So yes, yeah, same idea to diversification. And I tell my friends that only trade, they need some real estate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I tell my friends that only you do real estate, you probably need to do some stock hacking. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm pretty sure... Yeah, because again, most, most of us got into cash flow. Real estate doesn't that's not the same anymore. Not until we can at least do tertiary suites. But that'll take a lot With of two capital. Flexes isn't enough for you? No, because our target's usually like five hundred bucks a month for oh. cash flow. Yeah. Right. I need that third suite now if I'm gonna get if I wanna be able to add uh, another thousand a month. Right. But like think of how much capital that ties up, because that's that's probably more than two hundred grand in cap in capital at the tie up. Probably significantly more. I'll run the numbers another day. No, I probably have to type around three hundred and fifty of capital to try to get about fifteen hundred a month in cash flow. So, if you look at five hundred dollars cash flow a month, mm-hmm. if you looked at how much appreciation that property provides on an annual basis, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have to look at both. Mm-hmm. So, the cash flow pales in comparison. Mm-hmm. Still need both. Don't I want everyone to get away from that? Like you need both. You don't have to do both. This is my opinion. I think if for people who have want more, then definitely be doing yeah. both. No, but the thing is, even within real estate, definitely want cash flowing properties. Mm-hmm. But you also want to look at properties that might not cash flow, mm-hmm. but it'll appreciate way faster. Mm-hmm. And I just look at my real estate friends. Uh, not many are buying stuff that's nice for the for no. themselves and their family. Yeah. Right, it takes more time. My friend that bought the hot tub. He's been doing this for just a few months. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And he's selling a bunch of properties to add more funding to his yeah, account. <laughs> yeah. But what an amazing thing to assemble to look at on a daily basis yeah. to enjoy. And mm-hmm. just knowing this is this is all from trading. Yeah. 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 I look at our hot tub. Our hot tub was paid for by our real estate through a refinance. Right? Oh, okay. But like that's like the only nice thing we've bought ourselves from our real estate. You're so, getting a pool. That will be also half real estate, half stock hacking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it'll be it'll be good lessons for the kids because they'll they'll enjoy it plenty and and they'll know where this came, where it from. came from. Yeah, my kids will know when we get the boat. It came from my trading. Oh, you gotta tell your son. Hmm? Remember when Daddy said I was gonna give this up in a few? Oh weeks? no, I oh I mentioned that to him way back when. Yeah, yeah. He already knows I'm. I'm making pretty good money. You should name it something. Mommy bought this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Give me your I win logo. I'll put that on. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, I think you got to go with Pilates. Okay. This has been a blast. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. All right. Enjoy Pilates. Okay. Bye. Yeah. 
If you're feeling confused after all the YouTube videos, books, and forum posts, you're probably still left with questions. Starting in real estate is really tricky. Trust me, I know I've been in this for a long time. And the real estate's always forever changing. What our strategy is for 2020 is very different than what our plan strategy was for 2019. Anyways, frustrated beginners often ask how legal basement suite conversions actually work. Most of the time, we can only give general answers. But now we can go deep. After this in-depth, free class, you'll learn how to take your first steps as a real estate investor. Nothing's held back. Everything from analyzing basement suite conversions to renting out your first property for a profit, even how to refinance and do it all again. Uh, more secrets you'll uncover are profiting, how to profit in the hot market, municipal bylaws to watch out for, mortgage terms that favor refinancing, one barely used tactic for higher appraisals. And if you're frustrated, unsure how to get started, this is for you. Set up now and be the first to know about the next class. You can go register at investortraining.ca slash free class. Again, that's investortraining.ca slash free class. And just to warn you, you probably want to do this soon. Uh, we filled up the first classes. We've done, we have two booked already for 2020. The first one filled up in 30 minutes. The second one, we don't know how quickly it filled up, but it filled up in the first day. So seats are absolutely limited. Uh, demand is completely outstripping supply. <laughs> so when you go register, when you see a new class opens up, register as fast as possible and uh, hope to see you there. And yes, I will be there personally. Hope to see you there.